Today I'm going to talk about Chinese butterfly swords in this video which has been sponsored by Audible. More of that later. Now, what is a Chinese butterfly sword? Well, it's a type of weapon uh, that uh, originated in southern China sometime probably in the Qing dynasty, which is not all that long ago, maybe the 1700s, something like that. Um, and they are shrouded, as in all kung fu -y things, in legend. Oh, by the way, uh, sometimes they're referred to as butterfly knives, but that can be confusing because uh, in Britain, at least, we think of these things as butterfly knives, and they're actually illegal here because they're quite intimidating. Uh, anyway, Anyway, now a butterfly sword looks more like this. Uh, there are a few different shapes of them. There is, for instance, this shape, um, uh, but they're all sort of much of a nutshell. There's one that's slightly cookery like with a slightly forward curving blade, like that, but you can see that they're all pretty similar. Uh, so you have a short, a uh, cut and thrust blade with a, a knuckle guard on the on the uh, the hilt and a sort of um, a prong coming out the back uh, for catching opponent's swords. It can also be used offensively. Um, now the uh, particular style that uh, I was taught uh, of, of kung fu or kung fu or kung fu if you prefer uh, is called Wing Chun and Wing Chun has a form for the use of these particular swords called the Ba Zham Dao. Uh, I'm not going to claim to have ever been a master with this weapon. I was taught it a bit uh, and I thought I'd pass on some of what I learned. Uh, now, uh, if you're wanting to learn how to use these swords properly, uh, this is not a video in, in the Bart Jam Dao and so forth. If you want to, a martial arts lesson, you should probably be looking somewhere else. Uh, this is more general. Uh, now, uh, I wanted to show you the actual things, of course, and so I, I tried to buy some. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, in Britain, regulations and laws being such as they are, unless I am a member of a club that specifically uses them and I can prove that I go to that club and so forth and I buy it through that club, having paid for my insurance through that club and membership and all the rest of it, I can't actually get hold of some. Uh, but I do have something to show you because, you see, um, <clears throat> when I was uh, a student, um, I made some for practicing uh, for myself. Uh, but they're not exactly, they're not, they don't, don't expect to be impressed by my metalworking skills or anything or how fabulously deadly these things look because they, they I, I've warned you. Okay, so here they are. Yeah, I, I made them for practice. Um, I didn't want to hurt myself because uh, when you're uh, learning a weapon for the, the early on, uh, it is quite possible when you're not very expert to hurt yourself because you want to try out the fancy moves, don't you? And you end up hitting yourself and cutting your own wrist and so forth. And that's not very clever. But also... I thought, what a good wheeze it would be if I made them made them LARP safe, live action role play safe, uh, so that I could actually try them out against actual opponents using a variety of different weapons. They would have their axes and swords and spears and so forth, and I could I could try out these. Uh, so they are, you see, they are they are safe. You can you can whack and stab uh, with with any part of these, and you won't get uh, too badly hurt. Although, can I just say that um, obviously LARP weapons do have mass. And some people, I think, when they're given a, a live-action roleplay padded weapon, think, oh, well, it's been approved for use in LARP. That must mean I can hit anyone, anywhere, as hard as I like, as many times as I like. No, you can't. They still have mass. You know, when, when, a, when a boxer punches you in the face, uh, you could say, well, he, he, it's blunt and it's padded, so it can't hurt, right? No, actually, a boxer punching you in the face can hurt. So similarly, someone whacking you with the tip of a fast-flying sword in the face can still really hurt. So do be careful, kids. Now, um... LARP uh, was the, the way I, I tried these out against a variety of opponents, though I did, of course, train against Kung Fu opponents in, in, a, in a more of a classroom situation. So, uh, the Bart Jam Dao is the name of the form. A form is like a kata in, in, uh, uh, in Japanese karate, or karate, or whichever you prefer, uh, and it's a bit like a choreographed dance. It's a series of moves, uh, and the Bart Jam Dao um, starts with the, the both on, on, on your shoulder like that, and uh, you reach to uh, take a sword, at the same time you kick your opponent in the face, and then you just go shum, like that, and shum, and shum, and then into various other moves. Um, it's particularly suited to uh, people who have done Wing Chun, because once you've mastered the, the empty hand style of Wing Chun, where you have these, these moves, uh, you can then translate them to the sword. Now, here's one difference between Chinese Gong Fu and um, uh, Japanese karate, which is that uh, in Japan they would uh, take you on as a pupil and start showing you the basic stuff, you know, how to hit someone with a sword and how to hit someone with a spear and so forth. But 
If you showed great aptitude and dedication, then, after several years of proving yourself, they might, if you were very lucky, show you the secret empty hand technique. How to hit people when you haven't even got a weapon. Oh wow, that's only for the top people. Whereas in China, they had the opposite attitude. In the, well, the first thing we'll show you is just basic punching. And then if, etc, 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 then if you're very lucky, we'll show you how to use the weapons. Uh, because you wouldn't want to give deadly weapons to just anyone straight off the street, now would you? Um, uh, so there you go, to, to a, a cultural difference there between Japan and China. Uh, so it's only when you've been doing your um, uh, uh, bilji and Sinlum Tao and um, uh, so forth, uh, you're learning all these, these techniques, that uh, you are then introduced to those same moves with the butterfly swords. Now, with the butterfly swords, the translations are actually quite direct. So Bon Sao, Tan Sao, Jut Sao become Pretty much the same sort of movement, only you've put a sword uh, where a hand would otherwise have gone. Now the basic fighting stance uh, was something like this, with one hand ahead of the other. If you're right-handed, you would lead with your right hand, so you lead with your dominant hand. And I was taught to have the swords uh, apart like that, largely so that you can just see your opponent and read what your opponent's doing a bit better. So you have a two, a two layer of defense. If someone gets past this sword, you've still got this sword to, to keep you safe. Now, there is an assumption that uh, this weapon will be shorter than your opponent's. Uh, to give you an idea of just how short these are, uh, the ideal blade, lay blade length is considered to be uh, from the elbow to your knuckles, like that. So you can see these are the correct length for me. Uh, and one of the reasons is that you want to be able to do a lot of close-in work here. So you need to be able to do that. You need to be able to do that without hitting yourself. Okay, and you can see I can. And my arms are quite bent as I'm doing that. Because if my arms are straight to do that, not only is this actually more awkward, uh, but actually this is weak. And you have to be able to do strong moves which, where you actually could, could control someone's uh, sword. You could control their movement and push their sword this way and that. So you need to be able to keep your, your hands in a bit with a more of a bent arm. So if you can do that without hitting yourself with a comfortably bent arm in a strong uh, posture, then they're not too long. And... Uh, People who do HEMA will be familiar with this sort of thing. This is a messer. Uh, this is just, uh, I just bought it quite recently uh, to go to fight camp. And so this is the standard length uh, that they sell for HEMA use today. And uh, just to give you a comparison uh, there, you see? So the difference in length is quite stark. So uh, we are imagining then that we're going up against someone who has a weapon who's quite a lot longer than ours. Uh, why are these quite so short? Well, one of the reasons is that they were convenient for, for carrying around with you all the time, um, even though you weren't actually a soldier. And sometimes they were constructed so that they would both be placed next to each other like this and into the same scabbard. Uh, again, you've got to imagine that they're much slimmer than the, the, these fat padded versions. Um, now, I've tried some of those uh, 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 swords and they were quite uncomfortable. The, uh, the handles, the grips, were D-shaped, so they were flat where they met each other and curved on the opposite side, and the whole sword was sort of flat on one side, so that they appeared almost like one sword at first for going into the same scabbard. Not all of them are like that by any means, but that was uh, one way of carrying them, supposedly. Uh, so uh, there is this idea that, that monks and, and other, uh, other people would, would carry these rounds in case they get at attacked by bandits. Um, but so much is so much is shrouded in legend. So much of the explanation for all these things, I don't really believe. Uh, uh, all the kung fu books on Wing Chun and the kung fu, some of the kung fu teachers I went to took a lot of this stuff very seriously and passed it on very seriously. Um, I'll just give you just one example. Uh, one of the, the major legends about Wing Chun was that there was a time when all Wing Chun was known by just one person, a beautiful woman who organised a lot of. Um, uh, kung fu tournaments using herself as the prize. Any man who could defeat her would win her hand in marriage and champions came from all around China because, well, they would, wouldn't they, would they? Uh, uh, but of course, her kung fu was so much better than theirs that she defeated them all easily until one day a handsome man with whom she fell in love instantly at first sight came along and she deliberately lo lost the fight against him so that they could marry and only told him that she deliberately lost several years later. And blah, blah, blah. Come on, this is legend, isn't it? Uh, you're not going to believe all this sort of stuff. Um, 
um, that this happened sometime, that, that Wing Chun was developed sometime during the Qing Dynasty, that I can believe. So sometime around perhaps the 1700s, but um, the rest of it I, I think I'm, I'm going to take with quite a few pinches of salt. Anyway, so you're up against someone with a longer weapon than you. Uh, so um, what you are not going to do is try to hit them on the head or the torso because it's going to be very difficult for you to reach that and you make yourself very vulnerable to, to their strikes because they've got a longer weapon than you. So your, your, your targets are wrists and then once you've hit the wrists then elbows, then once you've hit the elbows then the shoulders and then possibly ankles and knees and so forth. You cut your way in. So he swings at you and you parry. Boom. One blade, this one, does the, 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 the meat of the work stopping the weapon. So if you imagine a slash coming in like that I stop his weapon with that one and I boom, hit him in the wrist with the other. Bah! And then, oh, so he tries the other side and I just do the same the other side. He tries down there. Boom. Wherever you, 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 one sword deals with the, the weapon and the other one is at the same time. It's simultaneous, which makes these very, very quick. Bah! Bah! You're hitting the wrist and parrying the attack at the same time. And as soon as you can get close to them, you do. This is the same with the empty hand technique. In Wing Chun, uh, the standard punch is just that. It's quite short. It's not a big, long swing which you lean into. It's a very short ranged thing. Um, so you are outranged by most other techniques. So you have to get close to them. Apparently the, the northern style of Kung Fu which used uh, these swords had uh, much more emphasis on kicking. Uh, but I was, I was uh, taught a, a southern Cantonese style which was much closer to, uh, to Wing Chun. So you're quite upright and as soon as you can get in, you get in. So you use one sword to control his weapon. So I've done that and I've parried his weapon and perhaps cut at his wrist and then Using, I'm going to, just for the sake of this uh, example, I'm going to use this sword to control his weapon like that as I come in to stab with the other one. So you go chum, like that. And it's got to be very, very quick and you've got to go in very decisively. So it requires a certain amount of boldness of technique. Um, but if you want to make very short weapons work against outreaching long weapons, you've got to get up to them very, very quickly. And as soon as you're in there, stay close. So you get up to your opponent and then you can you can cut like crazy. There are I'm, I'm slightly uh, <laughs> even with these short swords. There are a number of things in this room I can hit, but you can you can you can uh, slash with these these uh, upward slashes. Although that you you practice these in the forms. I'm not doing them terribly well because I haven't actually done this for uh, many many years. Okay, I'm very rusty. Um, but I can't imagine you would ever actually do this sort of thing very much. Uh, um, in a real fight, you might possibly just do one or two cuts with one sword that way, whilst the other one is keeping you safe. But you, you practice these so that they, the, the movements become uh, natural and quick and much better than I just managed with my left hand there. Uh, so uh, I get in, I control, and then I do some, some very quick cuts. Sometimes you get so close to your opponent uh, that the most convenient way of hitting him is with the guard, like a, like a knuckle duster, or possibly jabbing him with that thing, because you can, you know, that jabbed into your eye at high speed would be very inconvenient. Um, so they can be, presumably, pretty effective. Uh, and I'll get on to how effective I found them in a minute. But first, I should talk to you about the sponsor, which is Audible. Uh, now, Audible is a whopping great big online resource for audiobooks. They do uh, newspapers and articles and other things too, but it's, it's mostly books. And, and what book could I come up with that's relevant to, to this video? Well, I thought that an awful lot of you uh, might be interested in The Art of War by Sun Tzu, the very famous Art of War, which gets quoted all the time. Um, and yes, of course, they have several versions of it. And that's one of the nice things about something that's out of copyright on an audiobook uh, site, which, like the audio, uh, Audible site, has uh, a little button which you can click and listen to a sample, an audio sample from that book. So when something's out of copyright, like The Art of War, which was written ever such a long time ago, uh, then loads of people can create um, audio books of it and stick them onto sites like Audible and you can you can listen to all the various different voices and just pick the one you like most. Now The Art of War is quite a short book actually almost all of the audio books come in at about an hour and a quarter um, and I don't know how much I would really recommend it because uh, not only is it a bit short but actually the thing with Sun Tzu, it, it does say a lot of things that are, how can I put this, a bit obvious you know 
It is important that you choose the right place to fight your enemy. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, cool, better, better note that down, yeah, whew, good job you told me that, I said, I'm learning an awful lot here, this is gold, well, yeah, I, some of the, a lot of the things he says, actually, I think I'm a little bit on the obvious side, but I know a lot of you are military enthusiasts, and I also know a lot of you are sort of like me, and you think, well, how do you know, I've never actually read Sun Tzu's The Art of War all the way through, start to finish, and perhaps it's time I did, so that, you know, whenever an argument comes up about how great he is or how not very great he is, you can at least, from an informed standpoint, point contribute. Um, so in an hour and a quarter, if you um, got it as an audiobook uh, from uh, Audible, you'd be able to tick that box, that life thing. Oh yeah, I must get round to doing uh, Sun Tzu. Yeah, in an hour and a quarter, done. You'll have it done. Uh, although there is another The Art of War uh, by one uh, Niccolò Machiavelli, you know, as in Machiavellian, which is a great word, isn't it? And uh, his is considerably longer. His audiobook comes in at 10 hours and something. And um, a lot of the things he says are considerably less obvious than Sun Tzu. So uh, maybe you, you, could, uh, you could have a go at that one, or even both. Anyway, so if you go to www audible.com stroke Lindy Beige, uh, or you could just uh, follow the link which is in the description and click that, which is much quicker than typing. Uh, it'll take you to a landing page and you will find there an offer. Uh, you get free membership of the site for a month and you get one free book to download, which even if you decide not to, not to, to join Audible in the long term, you can still get to keep. It's yours forever. Um, and if you do think you, you quite like it, then you can carry on subscribing and it's uh, so many pounds a month for so many credits, so many downloads. Uh, or you can just pay for things uh, individually. Uh, anyway, so it's quite a flexible site. You can, you can always sample before you buy and even after you've decided to buy, you can still, uh, if you decide you don't like it, you can still change. So uh, there's no risk. There are an awful lot of books you can pick from and Sun Tzu gives you several options of different readers. So if you like a particular voice, a particular delivery style, you can, you can pick Pick the one that suits you. Uh, so, right, why not go down to Audible? So, back to um, uh, me and these things. Now, it could be that some of you are faint to curious as to how I made these. Um, it wasn't that tricky, really. I got an, a, a length of iron rod, and uh, it, it, goes, it goes down there, and then I bent it there, and it goes round here, and it's welded to itself there. I, didn't, I got someone else in a, a university workshop to do the welding for me, and then it goes up to there, and then the ends are very thoroughly rounded to make them super blunt, and then I scored um, a little bit down from the, the blunted ends to act as keying points to put on big blobs of something called milliput, which is this uh, epoxy resin putty stuff that sets as hard as stone. So there's a big lump there and a big lump there. So these are really very definitely blunt. And then I covered the, the rod with stuff called caramat. It's a sort of um, this stuff, you know, you, you take it camping, you have a roll of it on top of your rucksack that gets in everyone's way when you're making your way down the train and people look at you and get annoyed. But uh, hey-ho, when you lie on the ground uh, in your tent at night, uh, you don't get quite so cold uh, and, and, and uncomfortable. So that stuff. And then you get um, what we in Britain call gaffer tape. I think the Americans call it duct tape. It has many names. Uh, th this stuff and... Um, and then you, you cover one with the other. And this is how I, I did it. Now, a lot of people today might make LARP weapons out of um, moulds with, with latex and, and more sophisticated uh, ways. But, you know, but, uh, this, was, this, this cut it <laughs> in my day. So I tried these out in LARP uh, as well as uh, against uh, Kung Fu uh, opponents. Uh, and in LARP, I have to say, uh, mixed results, but, but reasonable. Um, what I found uh, was that, okay, LARP, is not a very realistic uh, battleground. Okay, LARP weapons do not behave very closely uh, to, to, to real weapons. They're not very good analogs. They tend to be a little bit light and a little bit bouncy. Um, and against people with very long, very light, bouncy weapons, I was sometimes in a bit of trouble. But if I ever did get, a, uh, get the right opponent under the right circumstances, I could make mincemeat of them. If I was up against a guy who had just an ordinary length, so something like this, if someone had just this, no shield, just this, or maybe an axe or a mace that's the same sort of length, uh, and I had room to move my feet, then I took them apart pretty much every time. Uh, I, I, would, I would usually uh, provoke an attack, they would swing, and boom, I'd hit them in the wrist. And then they'd swing, and I'd hit them in the wrist. And I'd get several hits on the wrist until perhaps that was enough and they had to drop their weapon because they'd taken too many hits to the wrist. Uh, or I was able to get in really close, uh, hook onto, onto the weapon, and jab, 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 and it would all be over very quickly. Uh, so against those, I did pretty well. Against someone with a big shield, I had a lot more trouble. Um, and 
I had a lot of trouble as well when people, uh, when, when the ground was not good. Because if, if you've got a weapon that um, considerably outreaches me, um, then I have to be able to close with you really fast. Uh, and if you take a swing at my ankle, I have to be able to whoop, uh, move my foot out of the way pretty quickly because I can't get right down to parry there if it's a, a really low sweep uh, with such a short uh, weapon. So I have to be able to move my feet. And I do remember, for instance, one time uh, I was monstering and I, and I ambushed some party member and I, or was it two of them, and I, I leapt out, ha ha, and you know, got in a couple of hits and you know, started well, started well, but then it all went a bit pear shaped because. Uh, I was in an area of bushes, and uh, though I had room to, to swing my swords up here, around my feet was a great tangle of roots and vines and so forth, and I could not move my feet properly, so I couldn't close with them. So once they'd learned this and they backed off, I'm not entirely sure they did learn this consciously, I think they accidentally uh, just, just backed off, and I couldn't close with them properly, and then I, was, I, I had short weapons and they had long weapons, and yeah, they beat me. Uh, I also remember losing against a girl called Bob. Um, now, Bob was uh, completely new to, to LARP, and uh, someone gave her quite a long, long sword. And uh, I gave her a tip. I said, look, if you don't know what you're doing, just sort of hold it like that and just sort of point it at that sort of angle. Just, just point it straight at someone's face and, and you jab and, and, and keep going from there. And you, could, you, should, you couldn't go too far wrong. Well, of course, I would end up fighting Bob, wouldn't I? And there she was. Oh, oh no, I'm up against Lloyd. He knows what he's doing. And so, so she did that, as I had instructed her. And uh, ha! I knew exactly what I was doing. I had these, and I was kung fu trained, and so I contemptuously—not actually contemptuously, but you know—let's um, let, imagine, just you know, for the, for the sake of the rhetoric, I, I, I contemptuously knocked to the side. It wasn't really rhetoric, but you know what I mean. Uh, for there's a storytelling. For the you know, I, I knocked to the side like that, and then dived in onto the point of her longsword, because her longsword was like a lot of weapons. Um, in, in LARP, a little bit sort of noodly, a little bit floppy like that. So what I actually did was I just knocked aside the tip of her sword, which then just went doing like that, straight back. Rather than knocking a stiff uh, metal sword uh, across like that, it just doing. So I, so I went, ha ha, oh. Uh, so you know, she got me. Um, so in LARP, mixed results, but I can say that the results against people in the gym who were Kung Fu trained were actually very similar. Uh, when someone came at me with um, a weapon, roughly the length of that Mesa, I could chop him in the wrist pretty much every time. Um, uh, it, it, so they are definitely uh, effective. Um, the, the way you hold them is, is pretty simple. You just hold them like a, a you just grip them with a fist like this. There's no, there's no thumb on the blade or finger on the ricasso or anything like that. You just grip them like this. These handles, by the way, are a little bit big. Really, there shouldn't be this excessive room here, they should be a little bit uh, uh, tighter on the hand than this. The, the, when, when you look at the real ones, they, they're a little bit smaller than this. Um, so this is the, the, the Chinese butterfly sword. You should be able to do that. And you get in quick and you slice them up. Um, they weren't, uh, as far as I know, ever used as a battlefield weapon. If someone had uh, plenty of armor and was fighting as part of a group, you wouldn't want to be armed like this. Essentially, if someone's in a, a large group of guys and you're in a large group of guys, then having a long weapon like a spear is, is, is really good. And if all the other guys have got spears and you're in a group, you don't want to go ahead on your own and uh, you won't be able to contribute much to the fight. You can, I suppose, parry, you could parry spears aimed at the guys next to you, but you're not actually going to be getting in there unless you're perfectly suicidal. So I don't see them as much of a battlefield weapon, but as a, as a personal defense weapon, uh, actually pretty effective. Uh, oh yeah, as long as you can move your feet. Sun Tzu said, the art of war is of vital importance to the state. Lindy Mage! Two, it is a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. The control of a large force is the same principle as the control of a few men. It is merely a question of dividing up their numbers.